Hello, and welcome to the digital launch of the 2024 edition of the Lowy Institute Southeast Asia Aid Map. The Lowy Institute is Australia's leading international policy think tank, and the Southeast Asia Aid Map is a flagship research product for the Institute. First launched in 2023, the map provides a comprehensive database which tracks all official development finance flows in Southeast Asia at the project level. Now, for those less familiar with the terminology, official development finance refers to public funds from governments or government-controlled entities for projects implemented in other countries for the purposes of contributing to their development. Now, this can be for projects for infrastructure, health, education, or poverty reduction, for example. The Lowy Institute team has synthesized millions of data points from official reporting mechanisms and databases, as well as thousands of publicly available documents to create the most comprehensive account ever assembled of development projects in Southeast Asia. This edition of the Southeast Asia Aid Map covers the period from 2015 to 2022. It includes more than 120,000 projects implemented by over 100 different development partners and totaling more than $250 billion in value. The research covers all 11 Southeast Asian nations, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Timor-Leste, and Vietnam. Through the map, the Lowy Institute seeks to increase coordination, improve accountability, and strengthen decision-making and the policy debate on aid, development, and geoeconomic competition in the region. In this digital launch, we are going to hear from key Lowy Institute researchers about what the Southeast Asia aid map can tell us. First, we will hear from Alex Dion, the project's lead researcher, who will discuss some of the key findings from this year's edition of the map, including some worrying trends in climate finance, but also the evidence on China's rapidly shifting role in the region. Next, we will hear from Grace Stanhope, our other principal researcher behind the project, who will discuss other key findings regarding support for gender equality, the role of ASEAN centrality, as well as how Southeast Asian nations themselves are increasingly providing development support to one another. Finally, Susanna Patton, the director of the Lowy Institute's Southeast Asia program, will provide her own key takeaways about what all this means from a geopolitical standpoint for the region. Now, let's hear from Alex Tayant, the lead researcher behind the Southeast Asia aid map. Well, the first key finding is that total official development finance to Southeast Asia fell to a new low in 2022. Development finance to Southeast Asia has been steadily decreasing outside the pandemic crisis year. In 2022, the region received $26 billion, an amount significantly lower than the annual average of $32 billion seen between 2015 and 2022. However, the whole period covered in the Southeast Asia aid map, the region received a total of $255 billion. Most of that financing has targeted the emerging and developing economies of the region, excluding high-income countries like Singapore and Brunei. Three quarters of that financing consists of loans, with 30% of those being concessional. Grants make up the remaining portions, half of which are allocated to smaller economies in the region. The second key finding is that development partners fall short to support Southeast Asia in its energy transition effort. Southeast Asia's energy demand is expected to increase by a third by 2050. But with few countries in the region having committed to seriously cut emissions, just energy transition partnerships struggling, and a renewable energy only accounting for 15% of Asia's power generation to date, the energy transition is at risk. The Southeast Asia aid map shows that international development finance for renewable sources of energy have been declining for the second year in a row. In fact, as pandemic-related support was scaled back in 2022, climate development finance overall declined by 15% in comparison to the previous year. This is at odd with the big promises from the international community on the global transition to net zero. This trend also reflects a broader reduction in overall development finance over the past two years covered in the map, primarily driven by a fall in support from traditional development partners. China, however, has been the leading financier of projects focusing primarily on renewable energy in Southeast Asia, as illustrated by its large hydropower investment in Laos and Cambodia. There are nevertheless significant concerns about the secondary impacts of these large-scale projects. For instance, those China-backed hydropower dams on the Mekong River are damaging a unique biome and imperiling the livelihood of millions of fishermen and farmers, while also creating unsustainable debt. 
But China is looking to recalibrate and green its Belt and Road Initiative, which could consolidate Beijing's role as main partner for the region's energy transition. And this is linked to my third point. Chinese financing is at its lowest level on record, but we think that Beijing will remain the dominant infrastructure financier of the region. From the start of the Belt and Road Initiative, Southeast Asia was to serve as the main focus of the BRI. The region of almost 700 million people was China's immediate neighbor and needed billions of dollars in infrastructure and other development. At the height of the Belt and Road Friendly, from 2017 to 2018, China spent an average of $9 billion in the region. But the map shows that in 2022, Chinese financing has plummeted to its lowest level on record, with only $3 billion spent in the region that year. Once the primary development partners for half of Southeast Asian countries, Beijing now holds this position only for Malaysia and Laos. There are a few reasons behind this. China's economic slowdown implies that Beijing is being more cautious when allocating funding overseas. In addition, Southeast Asian countries have not only grown more cautious over the infrastructure dealings with China, but also, at least for the case of the larger countries, more confident. This means that some projects have been renegotiated, postponed, or cancelled. However, the BRI seems likely to continue to play a significant role in infrastructure development in the region, and this for a few reasons. The first one has to do with Chinese legacy projects. The gap between what Beijing promised and what it has delivered in Southeast Asia is enormous and accounts for over 70 billion across various sectors, including infrastructure, health, and education. The reasons for this gap are numerous and include political instabilities in partner countries, weak stakeholder consultation, as well as China's most exclusive focus on financing ambitious mega projects, which are especially prone to problems and delay. But aside from a handful of cancelled projects and a couple renegotiated, most projects still seem to be proceeding, potentially leading China to providing an estimated additional $32 billion in financing in the years to come. Second, we think China will continue to play a significant role in infrastructure development in the region because Beijing is refining its offering, transitioning to fewer, smaller, and more targeted projects. In fact, at the latest BRI forum in October last year, we saw a deliberate evolution of the initiative. There is a clear intent in China to maintain a BRI that is long-lasting and adapts to changing circumstances and demand signal. Third, the demand for infrastructure is still here. Far from rejecting new Chinese projects, as some in the West had hoped, many ASEAN members continue to welcome them. And so moving forward, Chinese official development finance will likely continue to play a significant role in development financing in Southeast Asia, as governments continue to search for resources to meet their development needs. However, gender financing remains an area where China is lagging, despite the fact that this is one of ASEAN's main priorities. This year, for the first time, the Southeast Asia aid map includes a unique filter to capture global support for gender equality and women's rights. The region experiences high levels of gender discrimination compared with the rest of the world, and the economic cost of that social, institutional, and legal discrimination has been estimated at 200 billion US dollars to 2030, or 7.5% of regional GDP. International partners have responded to this and to a well-documented erosion of gender equality progress during the pandemic years. Gender equality finance providers tend to be traditional partners like Japan, Germany, Australia, and the United States. The Asian Development Bank was by far the largest contributor, mostly through integrating gender considerations into its very large inclusive recovery loans to the region's big emerging economies in 2020 and 2021. Those loans have driven an increase in gender equality finance from under 4 billion in 2015 to 9 billion in 2022. But all of that increase has occurred in spending for development work that addresses gender inequality to a significant degree, where it's explicit but not fundamental to the project. Meanwhile, spending for principally focused gender work, where gender equality is fundamental to the project, was lower in 2022 than 2015. That's positive for the integration of gender equality considerations into mainstream development work, but it's a step backwards for specialist work that is targeted and focused on gender equality and women's rights. At a regional level, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, leads much of the work on gender equality advocacy and research. In fact, it's the region's peak body and its member states are very committed to ASEAN's leadership on the world stage. 
It plays a vital role in coordinating the region's responses to transnational threats and challenges like climate change, human trafficking and disaster management. International partners will often reference ASEAN centrality, but our data shows that assistance is still overwhelmingly dispersed through bilateral or country-to-country -country channels rather than ASEAN. Just 1% of the support from the international community to Southeast Asia came through ASEAN. During the pandemic, traditional partners like the European Union, Australia, Germany and the United States recognised ASEAN's potential for coordinating and deploying a regional response. But funding through ASEAN has since dropped below pre-pandemic levels, despite its political salience. On the other hand, regional solidarity between ASEAN member states is on the rise. The aid map tracks what we call intra-regional cooperation, assistance from one Southeast Asian country to another. Surprisingly, the region's two wealthiest countries and its only high-income economies, Singapore and Brunei, are largely missing in this space, but Thailand in particular is providing a model for its peers. Many Southeast Asian countries occupy a dual role. Cambodia, for instance, is both the region's third largest recipient and its third largest provider of intra-regional support. Laos is the largest beneficiary, accepting help mostly from its neighbours Thailand and Vietnam. Timor-Leste, the region's smallest economy, is in fact its largest provider of intra-regional humanitarian relief. Flows between developing Southeast Asian countries tend to be for basic infrastructure like roads, and there are also frequently displays of cooperation in the aftermath of natural disasters. Volumes of intra-regional support are still very low, comprising just a quarter of a percentage of the total spend recorded in the map. But the establishment of aid agencies in several of the region's developing economies is a sign that the rise will continue. It's another indicator of growing capabilities and evolving relationships in Southeast Asia. Not only are Southeast Asian countries showing their agency by giving aid, when it comes to receiving it, they have more agency than ever before. That's because there's a huge diversity of development partners providing support to the region. The multilateral development banks, Japan, the United States, South Korea, and of course China are all active. And especially when it comes to grants and traditional aid, Australia and European countries are important. That matters because Southeast Asian countries have options to choose partners. They have agency. But while there is this sense of multipolarity writ large, the research confirms that when it comes to infrastructure, especially mega projects, China is dominant. The finding in the report that China is involved in 24 out of 34 infrastructure mega projects is striking. This matters because infrastructure projects are tangible, people can see them and they provide prestige for political leaders in Southeast Asia. Think about the Lao China High Speed Rail opened in 2021 or the Jakarta to Bandung Wush train opened in 2023. Yes, these projects have been plagued by cost overruns and delays, but people quickly forget about that when they're going for a ride. As Alex outlined, China isn't making as many new commitments to mega projects as it was in the past. Recent events suggest, however, that China will continue to make investments where it deems them strategically important. Think about the announcement of the $1.7 billion Funan Teco Canal in Cambodia which has been fast-tracked and is a high priority for the former Prime Minister Hun Sen. By contrast to China, this research confirms that traditional development partners like the US and Australia focus more on governance and human development. These projects matter and may ultimately be more important for the region's development, but they often happen behind the scenes. They require a more compelling narrative and explanation than infrastructure projects, which speak for themselves. The United States, Japan and others, including Australia, have recognised the need to compete on infrastructure. But especially in relation to the US, there's a sense of announcement fatigue with little action. Earlier this year, the US and Japan announced new support for the strategically important Clark Subic Corridor projects in the Philippines, projects that China had earlier failed to follow through on. Can they make tangible progress? The region will be watching and the Southeast Asia aid map will be tracking. Thank you, Susanna. So there you have it. The Southeast Asia aid map is a rich resource and you can access the full database online as well as ready to go analytical tools that help you do your own analysis to dig deeper into what is going on across the region. Southeast Asia is one of the most successful economic regions in the world. After decades of growth and development, the region is today very far from being aid dependent. Nonetheless, 
One thing the Southeast Asia aid map shows is that official development finance is still very important, still accounting for a big chunk of all public spending on infrastructure, health, education and poverty reduction, and in total equal to around a third of all the foreign direct investment that the region receives each year. So the fact that official development finance to the region is in decline, especially when it comes to climate finance, is very concerning. And as we have heard from my colleagues, China's role in the region is changing very fast and remains a key issue to watch. Thank you for joining us for the digital launch of the Southeast Asia AidMap.